Coming up on the Venus Cuckolgis podcast. This is taking the locus off of you, right? And it's putting you on from, from my sexual needs to our sexual intimacy. Yes. And yeah. that won't change basically until you get release. Uh, when, you're, when you're locked and you don't get release after the third or fourth day, you're not getting released. If you're if you have a high sex drive, your sexual need builds up, right? Yeah. Uh, the desire builds up, but it's replaced fairly quickly, not with the desire to get released, because your body the the cage is going to do a really good job of rewiring your thoughts about boners. <laughs> <laughs> so your body looks for intimacy and sexual pleasure elsewhere and this is where it got really amazing about the third day every little touch every little caress every little look from your wife keeps pouring more dopamine in there <laughs> uh, my wife started playing footsie under the table and i got excited and hard oh she's so cruel <laughs> that's not fair <laughs> she obviously enjoys being a key holder so much so, the seam of my penis cage split. At first, it was a bit of relief with the extra space. <laughs> but then, like all good things, it ended abruptly when the split seam was no longer being forced open with my heart on. So it snapped back into its original shape, <laughs> snapping a good chunk of flaccid dick. <laughs> You are now listening to the Venus Cuckoldress podcast, a place to learn all things cuckolding for the curious, the passionate, and the sexually empowered woman who wants it all. Go to venuscuckoldress.com to subscribe to the podcast, ask a question for the show, and find the elusive Venus Vault, a sneak peek behind the bedroom door. Now sit back, make yourself comfortable, and let's dive right into this episode. Welcome to this episode of the Venus Cuckoldress Podcast. I'm your host, Venus. Thanks for joining me today. I'm back after about a fucking horrible bout of COVID. Man, and was I fucking sick. Ugh, it's awful. I thought, you know what? I think it'll be mild if I ever get it because I'm super vaxxed. No. <laughs> it was a bitch. <laughs> so, oh my goodness, I'm back. My voice is pretty much back to normal, <laughs> 90% back to normal. Um, but I'm feeling a lot better. So I did have uh, a moan chat recently with Kayla to talk about the last episode that we did on humiliation. And if you missed it, holy shit, it was so fucking fun. <laughs> like, it was amazing. And by the way, apparently we maxed out capacity on the room. People couldn't get in. They were trying to enter the chat and they were getting a message saying it's full. Try again later. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. <laughs> so it was popular and it was tons of fun. So if you haven't downloaded the Moan app, you absolutely have to. It is so, so fun. Okay. What do I have today? I have Key Barrett on the show again. <laughs> he is one of my absolute favorite guests. He talks about, he's going to be talking about chastity do's and chastity don'ts and all sorts of horror stories. It is actually going to be a recording of the moan chat that I did with him. And he goes into all sorts of detail about the way that chastity affects men. And oh my goodness, it is absolutely fucking fascinating. So I'm 
happy that you're tuning in for this episode today. I think you're going to be blown away by what you learn about chastity <laughs> and entertain too, because we have some horror stories <laughs> or some funny, don't ever do this stories about chastity. <laughs> Okay, before I jump in, I just have a few updates. The first one being, oh my gosh, I have some awesome reviews on Apple from people. So I just wanted to do a quick shout out. Okay, the first one is from J-Dub and they said, love it, shines a lot of light onto this beautiful relationship dynamic. Thank you. That was a five-star review. Another five-star review is from Swiss Cake. And they said, this is an amazing podcast. And I love the latest episode. She broke down an easy way to get your humiliation kink. So thank you for that. Much appreciated. The next couple of announcements have to do with the Patreon. So I use Patreon for my fans to be able to support the podcast so that I can do this as my full-time job. So thank you to everybody who supports the podcast on Patreon. I'm hugely grateful. And I'm going to be giving out a giveaway to my Patreon supporters. So um, one lucky couple is going to get two complimentary day passes to the Hot Wife Palooza 2 event, which is in Palm Springs. And that is September 23rd and 24th. And it's at the Exotic Dreams Resort. It's a full hotel takeover party, lots of couples and single gentlemen. So this includes two 15 hour day passes. It doesn't include the flight and hotel, of course, these are just the day passes. But I'm going to be giving away a pair of of these passes to one of my lucky Patreon supporters. So what you get with these day passes, I'll just uh, quickly run through it. So Friday is sexy lingerie night. You get you can get there at 10 a.m. in the morning. So it doesn't actually close down until 2 a.m. the next day. So you have tons of time to spend at the hotel. You can hang by the pool, socialize, listen to music. There's going to be a live podcast by the pool by my friend, Doc Chocolate from the Bulls and Queens podcast. And there's going to be body painters, exotic massage, a Sibian ride event. Yes. Speed dating, complimentary dinner, and a evening DJ sex, sexy lingerie dance party. Okay. That is all on Friday. That sounds like a lot. Saturday is sexy BDSM night. So bring your badass self. And again, you can get there at 10 a.m. in the morning. It doesn't end until 2 a.m. Um, same events as Friday, except instead of speed dating, it's speed BJing. And I still don't know what this is. Speed blowjobbing? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm guessing. Somebody's going to have to let me know what that's all about because that sounds crazy. Um, there's also going to be an award-winning film director and producer, Roderick Stevens. He's going to be there interviewing uh, any willing participants for his lifestyle documentary called Open. And also Lifestylers Magazine's going to be there and offering free photo shoots. So there's a lot going on. Hot Wife Palooza 2. If you want some information about the event, you can just click on the link that's in the show notes for today's episode. Um, if you want to learn how you can possibly get your hands on one of these complimentary day passes, if you're a couple, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Venus Cuckoldress. Again, the link will be in the show notes for today. Speaking of Patreon... There is the new Helpful Cuck tier, which I've talked about on previous episodes. Love it so much. Like, it's so fucking awesome. This is for anybody who wants to help me out, finding bulls, picking out lingerie, whatever I need help with. Thank you. <laughs> but also, I've just added key holding to this. And I'm so excited about this. <laughs> because I think this would be so fun. Today's episode is all about chastity, and this is all about chastity too. So if you want to lock up, send me your key. I'd be more than happy to have it. So go to Patreon if you want to learn how to do that. That's the helpful cuck tier. Okay, now to get started with Key Barrett. Like I said, this is the recording from the Moan Chat. So I'm going to go ahead and do this intro right now and tell you a little bit about him. 
So Key Barrett is the pseudonym for a published author. What is not a pseudonym is the MSc. He actually has his Master's of Science in Anthropology. He studied sexual subcultures across to Europe and North America before turning his attention to female-led relationships and specifically what makes the good ones so strong. He writes both nonfiction and fiction with a female leadership bent. All works are judgment-free and always between consenting adults. So he has written two of my all-time favorite books. And the first is Surrender, Submit, and Serve Her. It's the definitive guide to enacting female leadership and embracing the female-dominated household. It is a great book. It is made for couples to read through together. And it is simple. It is just a nice, easy read, but it has some really profound ideas for you. And I I strongly recommend it. It's now actually available on audiobook. Yay. <laughs> the other book that he has written, which I absolutely love, is called Locked in Love, How Two Weeks in Chastity Can End the Barter System, Renew Courtship, and Make a Better Husband. And you have to get this book because you need to read about the barter system. That shit blew my fucking mind. I was like, oh my God, I've never even thought about it like that. It's crazy. All right. Here is key, my conversation with Key Barrett. Let's get started. Let's just jump right in. Chastity, do's and don'ts. <laughs> Key Barrett has joined me on the podcast once before. We talked about his book, Locked in Love, and I fucking love that book so much. Just to give a little rundown to all the people who um, aren't familiar with that book, holy shit, like it's so great. So basically, like Key, if I got this right, just correct me if I'm wrong, but if I got this right, you, you, you're a writer and you wanted to write about chastity, but you wanted to have some like firsthand experience about what it was actually like. So you tried it out for a couple of weeks and your wife agreed to it. And yep. the experience was so transformative that you were like, I have to write a book about this, right? Yeah, ex exactly. I, um, I write a lot of fiction as well and I try to be um, it's mostly femdom, but I do fem sub as well. I try to be, I don't want to write about things I don't know. Right. Yeah. So I, I felt confident about a lot of these aspects, but one of the characters, the book was the, the witch of Windsor magazine, which has a heavy amount of, of uh, chastity in it. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't talking out of my ass. So I told my wife, I said I was going to journal it. So I would, you know, be able to come back to these experiences and use them in the story. And we agreed on a week. And by about the third or fourth day, we knew that we really had to like, we had to see this out. So it very quickly became two weeks. And the stuff we discovered along the way was fascinating. Not always highs, right? There were some pretty profound lows that, that snuck up on me and, um, and I wrote about. And so we decided together that I would do the crux of the writing of the book, but that she would also be a partner in it and give her perspective on what it was like to be the key holder, which mm -hmm. is, you know, a big fun part of it because, you know, we'll go into those stereotypes, but she thought at first that it was going to be a lot more sex work, right? Like, yeah. oh, okay, here we go. Here's another thing. I got to do a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And uh, it just wasn't. So yeah, yeah, you got it right. I just expounded and, and ran off my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it because it like that book, there's two reasons why I love it so much. Okay. Three, there's a lot more actually, but I'm just going to keep with three right now, but uh, it's written for couples, like couples who are interested in learning about chastity and what it's really like. And it's not sexually based. Like it's very much relationship based. There's not a lot of like real kinky stuff in there. <laughs> like yeah. It is so cool because it really is it written in a way that um, uh, highlights the way that it affects your relationship. And I, that, that I found so cool. But yeah, and then the fact that she was very much a part of it and, and mm -hmm. contributing to that book and you put in, you know, her little 
her little po- notes and comments and stuff like that. And I loved that so much. It seemed very balanced because I don't think you find that real authentic female perspective about chastity very often outside of like the femdom world. So I thought that was so cool. I love the book so much. It's so easy to read. And um, it is like a very simple explanatory kind of way. But oh my God. Okay, before we get into this shit, because like I love this book so much, but it was the barter system blew my fucking mind. I was like, what is this barter system that he's talking about? Oh my God. Okay, as soon as you mentioned it, in that book, it, that was profound for me because, like, I was like, oh my gosh, I think this is the secret. Like, this is literally when you end the barter system, this is truly the secret to unleashing, I think, the real female centered sexual um, power in a relationship. I was just like mind blown by this. <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> So was you, I. <laughs> right? I, I'm like, I read this. I'm like, how have I not thought about this already? But this makes perfect fucking sense. So if you can just um, maybe just quickly r- uh, explain to the listeners tonight, what is what is the barter system? What's that all about? Hey, Jordan Harbinger here of The Jordan Harbinger Show. Subscribe to the only show that will show you how to apply the world's greatest ideas from the most striking minds. We've got spies and CEOs, athletes and authors from Kobe Bryant to Malcolm Gladwell, Tony Hawk and Howie Mandel, and the chairman of Google, founders of LinkedIn and Instagram, antiquity smugglers, con men, brilliant scientists, national heroes, and even the head of the CIA. Come join and have a listen for yourself. Subscribe right now to The Jordan Harbinger Show, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you're listening now. Okay, perfect. So I think when I describe it, a lot of men might think, uh, you know, I've kind of thought that before. Um, the barter system is a sort of subconscious system in a lot of relationships in which the person who has the higher sex drive engages in activities they hope will kind of add up eventually to being able to ask for sex, right? Uh, it, it is this trade between the partners where in in the the grand scheme of things there's nothing typically very wrong with it right we all like our partners to do stuff for us and we all like to reward our partners but it very quickly kind of becomes the default system and as the default system it's very impersonal it's very uh, transactional and this leads to uh discontent and lack of intimacy you know this idea on two on both sides there's this idea from the, the the person who has the lower sex drive and not always women. That's why I, I want to coach, you know, I want to make this very clear. There are men with lower sex drives and their wives and vice versa. And this is, I'm talking about this. I just want to put this one out here. I'm talking about this in a very male, female, ordinary, uh, native, uh, binary here, just because it's easier to communicate it that way. Mm-hmm. But this applies to any kind of couples relationships, whether you be, you know, ace, I guess Ace would be the one, probably the one that doesn't have the barter system for sex. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it is not a, a strictly straight couples thing. But from the the person who has a lower sex drive, you can recognize subtly when somebody's doing something slightly out of the ordinary, right? And it comes with this idea that like, oh, there must be an interior, ulterior motive behind it. I bet it's sex. Right. So this leads on that end can lead to resentment. And then on the the high sex drive side, when you're engaging in these things and again, you're not after a while, you're not really conscious about it. You engage in these things. You can build resentment when sex doesn't come because you feel like subconsciously that I have done the work. Where's the reward? Yeah. And that system goes away in about four or five days in chastity. It just, just goes away because you, you immediately, immediately become aware of it. There's no avoiding what is and isn't a sexually motivated act when you have your dick locked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love that so much. And I love that. It's like so fucking obvious to you 
with chastity. Like I, I just feel like chastity is this really uh, psychological tool. Um, yes, it's a physical barrier, but it's very much a psychological tool in whether you want it to be or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So I don't even know where to start, but I do. I know key. I know you want to talk about, <laughs> and I'm excited to learn about this, the biology of chastity. So please enlighten me on this. What is that? Okay, so you know you've read the FLR book too, so you know that I exhaustively research stuff yes. before I, <laughs> I put it out there. Um, with FLR, I had the benefit of several couples. Um, there is information out there. We joked about the the one about what happens when someone who's never when a man who's never seen femdom porn suddenly sees it. That was just one of the greatest. Oh, yes. Days. Okay. Explain <laughs> that. Explain that. <laughs> okay, there was research done, and and I don't have the notes in front of me, and I should have gotten them, but I wasn't going to talk about FLR. Um, I believe out of Australia, where they wanted to look at porn and how it affects men's views of female equality. So they found men uh, who had never seen femdom porn, and they made them take tests to kind of score how they thought about you know concepts like female equality and and all these sorts of things. And that was their baseline. And if you've ever taken any of these tests, unless you're a psychologist yourself or psychiatrist, they're very good at masking the questions. So it's very hard to figure out what they're really asking. And the ones that, by the way, there's some that do, and they just, that's one standard deviation. They just completely cut away. Mm -hmm. um, so they did this and then they showed them femdom porn, apart from the fact that like, where did they find men in Australia who have never seen this? I mean, that's a, that's a <laughs> question of itself, but um they showed them that and they scored them again. And it turned out that showing men femdom porn made them think more positively towards women, women in authority roles, women as equals, egalitarianism as a concept, like across the board. It was just like, oh, seeing women enjoy sexual power tells me that they're, I don't know, ready for other types of power. And maybe I've, you know, misthought thought of this wrong the whole time. But just the idea that, that, that femdom porn makes guys more likely to be egalitarian, whether that's their thing they like or not, right? They've, they've filtered for uh, whether or not you like femdom porn, because I think, honestly, most men that like femdom porn, if you were to score them on the egalitarian scale, they're going to score pretty well comparatively yeah. to the rest of the porn world. But they found people that had never seen it. So I doubt there's any self-selecting going on in there, you know? <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> It was just really fascinating. But so that's a little bit off the topic, but that's kind of a sign of how deep I go with the research. And so I really wanted to research chastity. And apart from speaking to 66 gentlemen who engaged in chastity, I went and found all the research I could find on it. And there's very little, but there's a lot of research around male orgasm. And so if you can look at the, the research around male orgasm and what happens when there is an orgasm, what happens when an orgasm works correctly, what happens when it doesn't, you can extrapolate what chastity is doing. And the simple part of this is, and there's a uh, dopamine and your body produces dopamine and dopamine is involved in learning. It's involved in excitement and it's involved not exclusively, but it's the big mover in pleasure. And dopamine, like any other uh, um, any other material like a serotonin or something, it's released, it locks on to a nerve receptor, and then eventually it's re it's taken back to its storage, which is a process called reuptake. Yeah. And as you have sex leading towards orgasm, your body releases more and more dopamine. The feeling that you get, that buzz, that sense of pleasure and joy, that's mostly dopamine. And it builds all the way up to climax, and then whoop, it drops dramatically. And one of the ways that your body can suddenly reuptake all this dopamine is it releases a hormone called prolactin in huge numbers. And prolactin, lact Lact lactation, if you think it has to do with like estrogen and producing milk, you're right. And one of the things that prolactin does is it really, really shoves dopamine out of the uh, out of the picture. But it also makes you feel calm and it makes you feel satiated and it make you makes you feel at ease. Um, so 
you know, anybody who's ever had an orgasm can tell you, right? This is, that's, geez, that's kind of how it goes. You know, <laughs> here I am. Wow, this is amazing. All the pleasure's gone. I need a cigarette. I'm just going to sit here and I could fall asleep, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it's accurate. <laughs> so your, your body releases dopamine all the time and it reuptakes it all the time. And the way it releases dopamine is if it senses something that it predicts would need dopamine. So intimacy, right? A, a, a gentle caress um, will release a little bit of dopamine. And, you know, playing a video game and having a, 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 a scene in the video game is particularly difficult and nailing that your body is releasing dopamine all the time. Taking cocaine releases <laughs> a shitload of dopamine. <laughs> it's one of the few ones that does. Um, so, when you have, uh, you, when you're, when you're locked and you don't get release after the third or fourth day, you're not getting release. If you're, if you have a high sex drive, your sexual need builds up, right? Yeah. Uh, the desire yeah. builds up, but it's replaced fairly quickly, not with the desire to get release because your body, the, the cage is going to do a really good job of rewiring your thoughts about boners. <laughs> <laughs> For lack of a better term, and I would just like to point out that the second I was released, any time it wasn't like my my penis had to go. Wait, am I allowed to do this now? Is this no? It was it was ready to go. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so your body looks for intimacy and sexual pleasure elsewhere, and this is where it got really amazing. About the third day, my wife taking my hand. I remember this, and it's in the book. You probably remember it too. Mm -hmm. I'm driving mm -hmm. in the car. She takes my hand in hers, and I got this wave of butterflies in my chest. Like we were on our first date, and I didn't know how well it was going. And then she took my hand in hers, you know? Yeah. That feeling, it was identical. And so, what's happening there, the mechanics is your body is releasing dopamine, and it doesn't have prolactin to shut it down. It has normal ways to reuptake dopamine, but every little touch, every little caress, every little look from your wife keeps pouring more dopamine in there. So you reach sort of this, I, I guess if dopamine was pot, I would say you reach a perma stone. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense, right? Uh, and it stays there uh, and it comes in waves because, you know, maybe you decide that night that you just really want to rub her feet or something. And that's the most sensual thing you've done in, in a week and a half, your body's going to release a lot of dopamine. It's going to feel really good. And as we kind of mentioned before, this is taking the locus off of you, right? And it's putting you on from, from my sexual needs to our sexual intimacy. Yes. And that won't change basically until you get release. Um, and the, some of the people that I interviewed had been locked for months. Now, when I say that, they are obviously taking it off for cleaning and all these other things, but they're staying mentally locked when they do that, right? Yeah. So, um, and th some of them report that they kind of not dread orgasm, but they're just not really looking forward to it because the feeling they have is really good. And I would advise that months can be a long time because when that crash comes, when you have an orgasm, the post-orgasm crash, it can be quite emotional. Right. You've, you've got this big release. And, and so you need some aftercare there. Yeah. So I, I've kind of wandered off from it. But the, the, the basis of it is that your body builds up dopamine slowly and it can't reuptake it fast enough because every single thing your wife or your partner does is sensual. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, yeah, and that just like, you know, amplifies the intimacy. And so this mm -hmm. is why. I was fascinated with chastity. Oh my God, we talked about this in the episode. It was so funny because <laughs> I didn't know anything about chastity until I watched this fucking porn video on <laughs> prostate milking. <laughs> I was like, I guess I had a, a, I think it was my boyfriend at the time mentioned prostate milking, milking and I was like, what the fuck is that? So I looked up, I looked up a video and I was, and this guy, the guy in the video walked in with a chastity cage on and I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> like, 
what is that? A fashion accessory? Like, what is this? <laughs> and then she like unlocked it. And I'm like, oh my God, mind blown. Like, what, what am I watching right now? And then the whole prostate milky thing and holy fuck yeah I it was memorable let me tell you it was memorable but I was just like whoa that is way 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 past something that I would ever be interested in because I was like this seems so weird and I'm sure yeah. that for people who don't understand chastity that it is like that they're like uh no there's probably guys yeah. in the audience right now who are like yeah no no, there's no way. I, I hear this all the time from guys. Yeah, there is no way I could ever lock up my dick. And I'm like, yeah, actually, you could. And maybe you should because there's all these great reasons why you should. But they never believe me. But um, it wasn't until my my very good friend explained to me these kind of psychological hormonal effects that he was having when mm-hmm. being locked and that that's like what you're you're explaining right now he was explaining some somewhat similar to me and i was just like oh my god there's a whole other side to this so when i read your book i was just like okay now i completely understand the benefit not just the benefit for men but the benefit for the couple and mm-hmm. so when but the thing is i think like in the topic of this Uh, moan chat today is like our favorite misunderstood topic is chastity and it's so true because nobody really not I want to say nobody but like a lot of people really don't even understand why they should do this or how they should do this and Mm -hmm. or there's like a husband who is really into the idea but has no idea how to approach this with his wife and (laughs) like this is probably one of those things where you have to be like super careful with how you bring it up (laughs) because if you go and put on the prostate milking video for her (laughs) it's probably not gonna work (laughs) it's sort of like this honey but no you know well so many people go to porn and it honestly it sparks their imagination about it they want to learn more and that's totally fine but deciding what chastity is from porn is like deciding what pegging is from porn, right? Right. Uh, the mechanics are the same, but the attitude is completely different. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I asked my wife to peg me and then showed me, a, showed her a video of, you know, a, a, a female dominant, like railing a guy and slapping his ass with him tied up and calling him stupid, she'd be like, nope. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's just not the way to go about it. And, as you were mentioning, I, I just want to call out one thing, Miguel, with the comment that like your wife reading Dr. Seuss is sexy when you're locked up. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. this guy gets it. This guy gets it. <laughs> uh, oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. So the, the term I use is, is, is couple, uh, enforced couples chastity, right? Um, it's not really enforced because you should always have a spare key with you for any such emergencies. And we'll get to that do's and don'ts later. But if I just call it couples chastity, it sounds like I'm Bible Belt preaching, you know, you don't have sex. And that's absolutely, as you know, as you well know from from my other works, that is not <laughs> that's not <laughs> how this chastity works. Uh, there's lots of sex. Um, actually, ironically, more than you would get beforehand for most, mm-hmm. if, if not mm-hmm. more than a higher quality sex, like you're way more mentally connected to. It. Right. Or the other spectrum is you think it's porn, what, what you see in porn. and and chastity in porn is really just a visual implement, right? It's just there to add to the humiliation level in a in a femdom scene or something like that. It's rare that you see it used in a context that is valid, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to to a couple, valid to a couple. I'm not I'm not shitting on porn, you know, the, especially not femdom porn, which tends to be more ethical in both its creation and what it's doing than other porn. So, um. But how do you bring this up? How do you say, how do you, how do you talk to a wife that you've been married to for 22 years and say, I want you to be my key holder, right? That is, how do you bring that up? Because on the face of it, chastity seems really kinky. Very extreme, extreme, right? Yeah. Could you break your dick if you did this? You know, (laughs) am I going to have to? 
lock you up every day and then unlock it? You know, what, what does this mean for me? You know, this is this big metal thing. And, and, you know, you've seen some of these, I'm sure by now, some of these, they look like, you know, <laughs> there's, there's one in particular that like, if you've ever seen old movies of like, you know, Chinese civil war where they have the cannons and it's like a dragon's mouth cannon. That's, <laughs> got, yeah. I've seen chastity devices that look exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a big metal dragon with like ruby eyes and shit and inside it is your penis um so there there's levels you can go here or you can go to the civil white plastic one or resin one that that's you know looks medicinal almost like yeah. like you, know, you pass it off as oh the doctor told me i have to wear this for six months because <laughs> <laughs> so, my, my dick is broken it's in a cast <laughs> Yeah, this is, exactly. Uh, you didn't, you know, you ever heard of those guys that broke their dicks? Yeah, they just, they it. it's a cast. Yeah, it's, you don't want it to form with a with a kink in it there. Um, so the the biggest thing that you can do is understand why you want it. First and foremost, if you don't know why you want to do this with your partner, with her specifically, then she's not going to know why she would do it. Right. Right. So if you have this vague idea of chastity would be fun, but I don't know what's going to happen with it. And I don't know what you're supposed to do with it. Then it is sort of going to come off. And rightfully so is just another sex thing she has to do or your partner has to do another right? task. Yeah. Another task. Exactly. So it it is up to you as the person who's going to propose this to know what you think you might get out of this, what you as a couple might get out of this and what you would want your partner to do as a key holder. And luckily, most of the time, that, is, that, that last one is the easiest one to answer. It's usually just be my key holder, unlock me when you feel like it, right? Right. And, and those two things are, when it's working, they're so easy for your partner, right? Because they're going to feel amorous, and you're going to find that your partner who doesn't always instigate, it's going to instigate. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be cruel about it too, because you told them it's okay. So they're going to be like, yeah, you know what, we're going to fool around, but you're staying locked this time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's incredibly empowering to them. And it's an incredible, the first time that you have, you fool around or you have sex that doesn't, that like you literally cannot have a release and you know this, um, it is, a, it is very, very mind-blowing because your mind takes over and says, all right, forget me. All of my pleasure is vicarious. So let's pay attention to every last thing that's happening with her. And you, you enjoy it a lot. You learn a lot. And you cannot fake that. You just can't fake it. And so your partner feels that attention and feels not – like this is too much attention for me because it's not that kind of attention. It's a legitimate, honest adoration that puts them at ease and allows them to just sort of sink into it and enjoy it at their pace with their decision about whether or not they need to have a climax. Yeah, right? because, and that is, yeah because the barter systems does not exist in that scenario. Exactly. <laughs> You've taken out the I'll get you across the finish line so I can get across the finish yes. line part of, of sex and turned it into, well, let's just let's just have some fun. Yeah. Let's just have some fun. Don't worry about me because I'm I'm watching you and this is the sexiest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Yes. <laughs> right? uh, <laughs> oh my God. Okay, but like how uh... How how would you port like how would you explain that to her in a simple kind of way though? I mean, I other than just reading the book together, I mean, I guess think maybe that would be like the best way to do this would be to read the book together because that's how you how you designed that book is for couples to sit down and read it together, right? Yes, and that is an option. If you'd say, you know, here's this book. I, I want us to read it about uh, couples chastity and all the good things that I think will come from it. And I'll tell you right now that this book is not a sex book. It's a relationship book that helps um, and that you can go that route, right? Yeah. There's, if, if you feel comfortable, uh, if you have a good enough communication with your partner um, to feel comfortable with that, that is an excellent way to do it because you get the book. The book is not long. You know, it's not, it's not Anna Karenina. Um, and 
it's very approachable. It's very quick. It, it gets into the science of it and stays away from the sexy parts until you're well into this and well invested in the idea, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, like, when I talk about the first time having sex while locked, that's, that's you know, that's well into the first week. So, you know, I, if, if you're still reading that as a couple at that point, you're ready for that kind of, well, <laughs> yes. let's get to the fun parts, right? Yeah. And so that's one way to do it. The other, so you, if you know what it is you're looking for and you know how it feels for for what it's supposed to do for you as couples, then you can approach this from a, a you have to be brave. Right. And one of those things is that um, I like to I like to talk about Erickson's stages. Um, uh, any psychologists out there, they're going to be like, oh, yes, Erickson, I love him. <laughs> um, and the regenerativity versus stagnation is a stage in life in which either you have something to offer or you feel like life has passed you by. Um, and the stage before that is the one where you learn that you don't really regret the things that you did in life, provided they weren't terrible, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about like murder. You regret that, but that you regret the things you didn't do, right? right? So, so the, you know, I didn't open that restaurant when I could have recovered because I was 35 if it failed, right? You know, you can't do that now. Uh, those are the things that you regret. And if you open the French restaurant and it fails, it turns out the people that do that never regret doing it. Right. right. When they look back on it 20 years from now, they never regret doing it. So the question you have to ask yourself in this situation is, is this something that's so important to me about our relationship that I'm going to regret not asking? Right. And if right. your fear is that asking to just look at chastity as a possibility based on everything it does for couples and communication or can do, right? It doesn't necessarily work yeah. for everyone, but if it doesn't work, it's not a disaster. It just didn't work. It's a disappointment. If your relationship is such that you feel asking your partner to look into this with you together for the betterment of the relationship, for better communication, better understanding, better sex, better intimacy, then and if you feel that that could result in the end of your relationship, then it's not chastity that's going to end it, right? right? This is, this. There, there is a concern there. There's an underlying concern there in your relationship that you need to look at uh, because you cannot live in a relationship where something you, th th I'm not saying this is a need, right? You know, th th that's, that's, if you want to talk about, Dump the motherfucker already, right? <laughs> <Damn> <laughs> that, that's different. This, yeah, this isn't a need. Chastity isn't a need. It's it's a a piece of communication. And if you feel that you can't discuss communication, when if you can't communicate about communication, then that's that's a real concern that has nothing to do with chastity. So, um, I I suspect that most couples. Well, most partners would be willing to talk about it. So, so couch it not as let's do this, right? That's, that's kind of taking away your partner's agency. Yes. Talk. Yes. Say it. Let's look into this together. Will you look into this? And then they're going to naturally ask, well, why do you want to do this? And that's when you talk about, I want to end the barter system. I want you to feel comfortable with my sexuality I love the idea of you owning it. And if that sounds really weird to you, you know, I got a ring on my finger and that's not <laughs> weird at all. <laughs> right. That's so true. <laughs> and, and I just want to see something that, 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 you know, who wouldn't want to have that spark? Who wouldn't want to have butterflies with their partner again? Right. Yes. And, and if you put it in those terms, then they'll be like, you know, okay, sure. You know, and then when they when you start reading it together, either it's going to be something that she's like, this really isn't for me, although that's kind of rare because all she has to do is nothing. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> I just couldn't it couldn't be easier. It's just literally just like, here's the key. And there's a spare yeah. one over there. So, it, you know, whatever. It's just a key. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, sometimes when my wife wants to, she wears it, but it's not a requirement. Right. She knows that if I see her wearing the key, I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. There's that dopamine again. <laughs> yes. There's something about that 
having like showing the key. Oh God, the reaction that a guy gets is pretty amazing. Love it. Mm -hmm. Love it. And and there's something in a couple's basis, there's something really, really sweet and charming about that, that, that your partner just loves the idea, gets turned on by the idea that he belongs, his sexuality belongs to you. Yes. Right. Like it's yours. And that turns him on. I mean, how, how empowering is that? Right. <laughs> and that's exactly it. I remember the very first time I held a key for someone, I felt that I was and I was not expecting that because um, they really didn't like I didn't know much about it. But I felt that sense of power. And I was just like, wow, this is actually kind of fun. <laughs> like, I like <laughs> it. I like it a lot. I want to learn more mm-hmm. about this. So yeah, I think that um, it is really not a lot for her to have to do. But the I guess the symbolism of it is really intense and empowering for her. My name is Tom Buck, and this is The Enthusiasm Project. Join me each week for deep dives exploring the world of what it means to be an independent creator on YouTube, starting your own creative business, and keeping a positive, enthusiastic mindset along the way. New episodes of The Enthusiasm Project are available every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, um, the I, I don't know if anybody here knows the semiotics, which is kind of, basically it's it's symbolism as as communication. So it's such a big thing. No big surprise. I come from the advertising world, so I can tell you that when they shoot a commercial for Tide and it's going to be a wife, they bring a box that has fifty different types of wedding rings to make sure that they get the right one for that message, right? Is this commercial geared towards Lifetime Channel? She's gonna have a huge rock. <laughs> right. If, <laughs> if if this is uh if this is gonna be on uh ABC during whatever, you know, maybe it's gonna be a, a simple band, right? They they come prepared because there is nothing that happens in imagery uh for advertising that isn't intentional. Right. If if this commercial makes you feel this way, somebody that somewhere has a list of feelings that they hope that will happen and feelings that might happen. And it's going to be in that list. That's semiotics. They use symbols. And so humans are geared towards this. You know, we see faces in rocks and clouds. Right. We're geared towards symbology. And so we wear wedding wedding rings. Um, It is a symbol that carries a meaning for everybody. So the. Chastity device itself is kind of a symbol as well, because honestly, if you're really motivated, you can get out of it. Yeah. I mean, depending on the device, it can be quite hard to, no no pun intended, (laughs) get out of it. Um, But, you know, the the key as a symbol is super powerful. Um, And seeing, you know, for her, she prefers the metal, right? Seeing it, it's very powerful to her, too. It's there's a guy out there caged lion who who talks a lot about this as well and he and you know that's literally what his wife thinks it looks like (laughs) (laughs) but that's a great metaphor isn't it yes i love that okay so um how can how can couple like what are the right ways for couples to do this like let's get into the do's and don'ts like i'm so excited for this because I know you've been collecting stories about what not to do. <laughs> oh, I've got three stories to tell you, horror stories, and oh, maybe God. one of my own. But, uh, they all have happy endings. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't but, wait. Um, I can't wait. But let's, yeah, let's jump into it. Okay. For couples, chastity do's. Do talk about what you're feeling, right? It, it, it from his perspective, it, it, you might around day three start to feel some really weird things, most of them good. Communicate those to her or to your partner. Talk about how you're feeling about them, how um, you can talk about how you're embarrassed that you didn't before because you want to and you missed it, right? right. There's no shame in telling them, I missed this about us, right? That That is uh, – I missed feeling this way about you and it's got nothing to do with you. That's the beauty of it. I know now because I'm wearing this cage that's causing these effects in me that it was on my side of things that I got comfortable with the barter system. Um, and I didn't even know it. Right. Yes. Um, 
So do communicate. And from, from your partner's perspective, to be able to talk about, hey, I'm really loving all the attention. Um, you know, I, I love that when you give me sexual attention, you know it. Like one of the things that I noticed really quick was all the times that I caressed my wife's ass. That wasn't just a nice sort of, you know, hi, I'm coming in here to get coffee. It was sort of like the hand is lingering. <laughs> right. Yes. Like, okay. This, this went from, from intimate caress to intimate caress, dot, dot, dot. And <laughs> right. right. Uh, so they, they feel comfortable talking to that. So couples communication is the key. Take advantage of what it's being given to you with this opportunity. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, talk about what you don't like about it. Talk about, uh, um, if you do have sex and chastity and it's awesome, talk about how awesome it is. This doesn't mean you're going to, this is the only way you're going to have sex. I mean, you can, if you're both happy, why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's awesome to talk about it. It's, it's because it's reinforcing the more and more that your partner hears. It was just amazing to focus on you. Oh my gosh. The sounds of your orgasms, the little note, the little hints and notes and, the way your hips move that I'd never noticed before all the times I've been down there. That is music to any partner's ears. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> no one's ever going to be embarrassed by that because they love you and they, this is what they want. And to know that they make you that happy, it's, it's heaven. And, and so that's pretty much the couple's do's and don'ts. And then I've got some for him and some for her specifically. Okay. So for him, always do. Here's a do. Do always have a key with you. Just have it on your keychain. Have it with you. Um, of the 66 people that I interviewed, the worst that happened was somebody um, sustained a pretty big cut, but they they said that that had something to do with with not just the chastity device, right? Oh. But the most was abrasions. But you know what? They all probably had a key too. And there are times when, let's be honest, sometimes you'll get an erection that just won't quit. For instance, morning wood. It may have nothing to do with sex. It's just your body going through the, okay, systems check, <laughs> right? You know, rev the engine. Um, normally that goes away, but sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't go away after a while, and now I sound like uh, one of those those blue pill commercials. If you have a heart <laughs> on that doesn't go away after four hours, consult your doctor and unlock your penis. <laughs> Use your spare key. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, you might forget you're wearing it and holy crap, I didn't realize that the school that I'm going to go see little Billy's um, you know, Christmas pageant now has a metal detector. <gasps> oh God. <laughs> that's sadly that's not a real story uh one of the, the, the <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure it's happened um but so and and just in case you know testicular torsion happens whether you got a chassis device on or not you just want to make sure that if you need to get out of this thing you can get out of it right yeah so that do take it off if it hurts in any way that feels abnormal all right now my dick hurts because it's kind of hard in a metal cage is normal, right? <laughs> Say that louder for the ones in the back, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, can't, I can't feel my balls is not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're turning purple is not, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if it feels abnormal, take it off. You can practice uh, chastity without the cage on, certainly for a certain period of time. Um, it, the cage makes it more fun. It makes it more real. It makes it easier to hit these uh, dopamine stages, right? Because part of this is when you look at your wife and you get the dopamine rush, your 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 penis is going to respond, and it's going to respond. It's going to uh, grow against the cage. You're going to feel that. It's going to kick another dopamine rush. Yes. So it just sort of helps, right? Yeah. Um, but but. You know, you can take it off for a little bit because that's the next one. Do keep it clean. Keep yes. your penis clean. Keep the um, the device clean. Uh, steel is easier to clean than resin and plastic. Uh, you can run a lot of them through the washing machine, which I wouldn't recommend doing all the time, um, especially if you say don't live with if you live with <laughs> tiny people or roommates who might be. <laughs> 
What's this? I, I've seen what? I've seen these cages that are like almost completely enclosed with this tiny little hole at the end, and I'm like, oh my god, yep. that's got to be the worst for keeping skin integrity. Like that is just it. It's going to be just nasty and hard to clean. And I don't know. That's just a recipe for disaster, if you ask me. The more open air you have going on, like with those, the metal ones that have like, you know, just Uh the bars instead of just like it completely being enclosed or is better. But yeah, I, I think maybe some of the people who make these cages are not really thinking about the hygiene part. Are you saying that the, uh, the multiple cages that you can get that are shipped from Guangzhou, China for <laughs> 15 bucks on may Amazon. not have had the highest integrity of, uh, of quality of design. Yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's a woman behind it. That's, uh, that's designed it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, it's certainly not Joni I for, uh, uh, or Werner Braun designing these things, but, but most of them do the function. So the steel ones are good. I would say much if you have a wedding ring, you know what you like about the inside of your wedding ring as far as it feels on your finger. Yeah. Uh, try and find the exact same thing with a metal device, right? Oh. There are metal ones that are, are, are sort of hoops. The hoops are sort of circle shaped and there are metal devices where the hoops are, are basically um, f- flat and they're, they're both fine, but one of them has a much greater comfort when your penis expands and contracts, right? Because the skin isn't rubbing against a rough corner. Oh. Although there's no like rough edges. It's just, you know, there's an edge. If you think of like a traditional wedding ring, the inside of it is flat and then there's a sharp edge, right? right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but they've gotten wise about that. So they now round the edges. They're sort of trapezoidal on the rings um, so they don't hurt your finger waggling around on them so this you know your finger is a penis with a bone <laughs> so it's, it's basically the same thing um the plastic ones i have multiples uh the plastic the resins the one that you're describing is extremely comfortable to wear if uh it's just light it fits well um believe it or not your penis kind of prefers to try and to expand in a closed space i mean everything's subjective of course but that sort of uniformly puts pressure on it, whereas the the hoop ones can um, oh, allow yeah. expansion between. Again, another reason why the hoop ones should have rounded edges because of the expansion between. And if you're going to go play tennis with a, a chastity device on, the the resin is basically the only one you can do without um, really yanking on. <laughs> 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 it's it, it's not the penis that cares about being yanked on it's the testicles and you will find that if you wear metal ones especially when you first do this and this is in the book your cremaster muscles are the muscles that if you've ever like you know if, if you're a man and you think about lifting up your testes when he says cough right the, mm-hmm. the muscles that pull them up and pull them closer and release them down are the cremaster muscles um if you stretch them it's fine nothing's going to happen to them you can stretch any any muscle but you will feel, uh, if you stretch them for too long, you will feel a pain akin to blue balls because it's exactly the same space that, that blue balls would occur. Um, and it can be kind of scary. It's like, I've been doing this thing. Now I have nonstop pain. It feels like blue balls. Have I you know, done something? Am I not clearing stuff out, right? And it's just the fact that you've stretched these two muscles that make a V in your pelvis. Um, you stretch them and they're aching. Oh. So the plastic doesn't do that. The resin doesn't do that. The metal will because it does have weight. Um, so that's that's uh, know your know your know your kink, know your preference. Uh, I can tell you that a forty dollar metal one, if it fits your needs, uh, bought from from uh, a Chinese place, is completely sanitary. I haven't had a single one of these rust yet. Um, they're stainless steel. I haven't <laughs> haven't had my skin turn green or anything like that. Um, they're pretty reliable. Um, and they're cheap enough that if you feel like you get one and it doesn't quite work, figure out what doesn't work about it and then find one that's similar that does have what you want. One of the things that I learned early on was the O-ring, which is the part that goes around your testicles and your penis. Um, the old uh, old style is just a circle, right, with the clamp part that uh, the, the lock goes into at the top. But the yeah. new ones are a circle that's bent at the bottom to more accurately reflect the shape of your pelvis. 
And oh. those are far more far more comfortable and they allow your penis to naturally point down like it wants to a little bit better. So they're a little bit better at hiding in clothes. So oh. all these things. Uh, yeah. So I know we've gotten off the do's and don'ts, but it just, you know, it just seemed like a good, good time to talk about that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and anybody, I, I'm sure that some of our guests who do practice this will laugh at this as well. And you have as well. The fact that mm-hmm. chastity devices are, in amazon's algorithm system such that if you live anywhere near a large city you can get one in in two days just tells you how many people are doing this because (laughs) amazon (laughs) their whole thing is they do not waste warehouse space right that's they have prime day to get rid of the stuff that's just sitting in a warehouse that's basically what prime day is and it's so successful selling stuff at a discount so that they can put more important stuff in the warehouse that they do what prime day three times a year now I don't even know, Um, but it's hilarious that they have chastity cages that you can get delivered like right now um, because there's such a demand for it. It's hilarious. Right. Right now, the algorithm is saying have seven of these chastity cages in Cambridge because that's how many we order a day in Boston, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So uh, it's it's a. I don't think it's going to be the next thing to break through, like like pegging broke through. I mean, when Cosmo started doing, how do I ask my boyfriend I want to peg him? I was like, okay, well we, we've we've hit hit peak saturation on pegging. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure we're going to get there with uh, chastity, but it is definitely becoming more and more prevalent, and it's certainly something that I think people will at least know of. Most yeah. people will know. It well, soon. somebody's got to design the sports version of the chastity <laughs> cage. Like Nike's got to get on this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, there are, here's it's they're already made in China. Do we really just need Nike to go ahead and just like put their name on top of it? I'm sorry, that's a cheap shot at Nike, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So what what are the don'ts then? What what? Let's get in. Let's right. get into this. Okay. Chastity don'ts for men or for, for penis havers. Don't make, don't make it about your kink, right? You're going to enjoy this ride, right? Uh, If you start making it about that, you're, you're losing the focus of, of this is we more than me. Oh yes. We need to like emphasize that part. Cause I have been annoyed with that before um, where I'm like, I feel like this is not really even about me. I'm like, this is about what this guy wants so bad, you know? (laughs) Yes, exactly. And one of the ways that you know that is the next one. Don't demand that she unlocks you for sex Mm. Um, or or release. If you need to be unlocked, you can ask. Of course, she's going to say yes. Right. Unless unless she says no. And then then you know what? She's in. She's in for a penny in for a pound. If she says no, (laughs) she's like, oh, this this is this is as much her thing as it is yours now. So congratulations. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But if you need to be unlocked, don't demand it ask it stay stay true to the reasons you wanted this in the first place right which is that you want to be more connected to your partner intimately if you if you revert to saying i need this now you have taken the intimacy away and put the locus on you specifically your sex drive yes it's okay to have the locus of attention on you for a lot of things i am not trying to make men into selfless martyrs or, or, or any of that kind of stuff. This is not what this is about. Um, lots of alpha guys lock up that, it, <laughs> you know, they it's, do. it's not, it's, it's not any of this stuff. It's just about like, are you learning the lessons or are you not? And so if you demand, she unlocks you, you haven't really learned anything and you sort of invalidated in her mind, everything that she might have thought had changed. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you you just you've just basically said that was an act. Right. And in that regard, that's kind of no different than the um, barter system. Right. And this is a huge one for those who are locked. When you get unlocked, especially if it's been more than three or four days, especially if you have a very high sex drive, when you get release, you're going to bonk. You're just going to crash. It's a bit like. um, uh, 
the, we know subs have a crash after a very, very intense um, session with a, a with a dom, right? Yeah. You have been building up dopamine slowly for a very long time, and you just got rid of it in like less than a second. It's it's amazing how quickly your body can reuptake all the dopamine, right? Uh, and normally that's fine. You would be satiated and feel good, but there's, you did this and you built intimacy along with it and an emotional connection to your partner with it. And you just, you have an emotional crash. You will have the crash. It's called the bonk. It's cause it's kind of similar. If anybody knows bonking from like biking where you're just biking for so long and then like 30, 40 miles. And then suddenly you're just like an emotional weepy wreck. And it's because you haven't eaten anything and you've gone through all your calories and your body is trying to stop you from using more. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's emotionally mm -hmm. crushing you. <laughs> the best way to get you off the bike is to have you cry about the, uh, the state of the world just out of the blue, you know, I'm going to pull over. <laughs> so your body is going through something very similar with the dopamine crash. It's gone. Prolactin's come in, but you're not getting the same amount of prolactin that compares to the amount of dopamine you lost, right? Oh, right. A regular work has them. They're similar. Your body doesn't know how to do the other side of this. So it just puts out the same amount of prolactin. And this is actually something that going back to the science of it, it's really interesting. And I want to see studied is that, so dopamine goes away at orgasm and is replaced by prolactin, except is it the orgasm that triggers it? Because if you do a ru ruined orgasm, and for those of you who don't know a ruined orgasm, that's going up to the point of orgasm and then stopping anything and just letting the orgasm happen. Um, if you do a ruined orgasm, your dopamine does not get taken up. <laughs> you, so, so the question, be and that's why you can keep having sex after one of those. And, and that is um, oh. sort of, yeah, you can go, there's no refractory period and there's no prolactin overload to shut down the sexual desire so the question that i want to know is is it a pro is it the orgasm that triggers the prolactin release or is it enough dopamine that triggers it regardless of the orgasm right because as we know as men the dopamine spike is like a tangent it's very quick yeah. when you go from i'm really enjoying to this to oh this is the moment Right. It's 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 a slow build and then it's a shot. It's a it's a moonshot, literally. So <laughs> um, I'm suspecting that it's like if you get an, enough because dopamine only exists in limited amounts in your body, which is really interesting. Um, if you get enough dopamine released uh, that it just that's what triggers the prolactin, whether you're having an orgasm or not. And so obviously the way to test that would be like just inject people with a shitload of uh, <laughs> dopamine and see if it triggers a prolactin response. Uh, but I got a little bit off topic there just because it was interesting, but just a reminder, the bonk. So the way you deal with the bonk is know about it ahead of time. And then she cuddles you. She just cuddles you for 20 minutes. Yeah. Just, this is just there with you. And you know what? Her touching you, her holding you, this isn't going to release a lot of dopamine. It will, but it also releases a lot of other really good hormones that make you feel stable and comfortable and happy and okay with it. But even if that, just, just know if it takes you a day, take your day, right? Take yeah. your day. It's not, it's not abnormal to just kind of be bummed out. The good news is you can get locked and in three days, be back to where you were feeling. Uh, you won't be bummed out for three days. I'm just saying you won't hit that high again for three days, but you can be there for as long as you want. Just, just know that this will happen. Don't get caught off guard by it. Cause I did. And I was like, what why is you know this isn't the this isn't the um the the stupid dog commercial with what's her name lilith fair singing about it why am i crying at every every, <laughs> every commercial on tv why am i so damn depressed this is supposed to be fun yeah. i've actually heard that from many guys actually who are who practice long-term chastity and they you know they want it, they get, you know, they look forward to this release, they, they get it, and then they regret it. They're like, oh, I, I actually wish I, I didn't do that. I wish I was still locked. <laughs> 
like, and I just was like, I didn't understand that. Like, how do I wrap my mind around that? Like, it just, and now it makes sense when you're talking about that kind of drop that happens and how emotional that can be. Yeah, I've heard it described akin to falling off the wagon. Yes. Right? Because now your your day chip is back to one uh, and and you haven't built up. You got to build up all over again. So there is that. But the, the point is for some people, they want to go a long time. Some people are great with a week, you know, then then because you get right back into it. It all depends. And it's all about what you and, and your partner want. Yeah. You know, my my wife and I do one week a month and it it's happens to coincide with the week that she does not particularly feel sexy. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, it has made her feel very sexy <laughs> during during that time because she feels like, you know, all pressure is off, all bets are off. And here's this, you know, in the time which I feel particularly awful, here's this cuddly, snuggly, warm bear who just wants to be near me. <laughs> yes. Right. And, yes. And, and that, that works fantastic for us. But uh, that's it. One week a month. And that's that's how we do it. And some people do it, you know, um, we've been on you've talked to keys and anklets you know we talked to michael it's like some people do it and it's like oh i'm i'm never locking him <laughs> he just has to watch right yeah but he's happy you know and and he probably is yeah okay. i think that's very true it really depends on the couple it, it depends on what you both want i think yep. there's this idea that chastity equals you're never getting unlocked you're permanently sexual de- sexually denied and that's that's not rea- reality for most of the people, I think. Um, it, it's a little bit more tame than that. So all of these guys who are yeah. so scared of the thought of chastity, who are like, no fucking way. <laughs> I'm like, actually, you could do it. I mean, you could do it for three fucking days. You could do it for five days. Believe it or not, you could do it for a week. <laughs> you could, yeah, you could do this, do the first time for two weeks just so you get the full ride. And then you don't ever have to do it for two weeks again or ever again, or you could do it for the rest of your life. But yeah. but it's worth it just to see, just to not rewire your brain because you're not changing who you are. You're just helping yourself see subliminal things you've been missing yes. right? about you, about your sexuality, about how it affects others in ways that you don't intend. That's the thing. I didn't intend to barter sex with my wife. I didn't intend to be... You know, I thought we had a very good sexual relationship and she did as well. Right. Yeah. So there wasn't a problem. This wasn't a problem we needed to fix. And you shouldn't think of chastity as something that will fix problems. But because um, it's not. But we both saw, oh, it, it was more of a complacency born out of of just life, not anything about her or anything about me, but just about life and being able to see what the triggers were allowed us to just really, even when I'm not locked, you know, I'll never not notice when I'm running my hand a little too long on her ass. But this time I'm just like, I'm just like, Hey, you know, I'm doing this. (laughs) You can't, you, you cannot be ignorant about the barter system anymore. It's impossible. Once you're aware of it, you are aware of it. (laughs) Yes. And and I feel comfortable when I'm aware of my sexual desires to say that. And she feels comfortable to say, yeah, or no, or how about tomorrow, right? And it's not because, one, she has a lower sex drive than me, right? So she used to feel this incredible pressure to keep up right. and like she was failing, like she was failing me. And, of course, she wasn't. Um, but how do you tell her that she's not and make her believe it? Yeah. And then – chastity allowed us to one for her to feel over and over again that i think she hung the moon yes yes and that i love her pleasure and that if ever she feels like i'm not really feeling it right now and you are she feels both okay to if why don't i lock him up and see how that works out for me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or she also feels comfortable to just be like, hey, you know, go take care of yourself. It's totally cool. It's yes. not a thing. And it, it it's not – I think I talked about this. One of the things that we learn as men when we lock our cocks up is how much we use masturbation as purely a stress relief, not a sexual relief at all. Just a, well, fuck, that meeting sucked. <laughs> <laughs> 
and you're not thinking about it consciously, but of course you're getting this huge, massive dopamine rush, and then you're following it with the uh, uh, a, an, an estrogen similar hormone that tells you you feel full and great and happy, right? So right. of course, and it's okay to use masturbation for that. I don't want to say otherwise. I'm not a prude. I'm not a puritan here, but you need to know when you're doing that because you'll wind up using it in times of stress relief about your relationship. And that's different. You need to be talking about that, not just being mildly frustrated and, and going, you know, and I'm going to go off and masturbate and then I'll feel better. Right. right. You know, yes, that that's not that unhealthy because many relationships survive that. But the fact that you don't know that that's what's really happening is not is is not to either one of your benefit. And when you do, you wind up, oddly enough, not feeling guilty about masturbation at all because you're doing it for sexual release when your partner knows and says, I can't do it tonight. Go ahead. You know, yeah, I'm not worried about I'm not worried about asking you for sex tomorrow if I suddenly feel it. And you being like, nope, I masturbated yesterday because you have a high sex drive and I don't. And I know you'll be ready to go. Right. Right. So. Okay. And, um, what about the horror stories? Should we, should we get to that? <laughs> yes. Yes, we should. Can I do the do's and don'ts for her yeah. real quick? Oh yes, yes, yes. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she should communicate what she likes about the changed behavior and what she doesn't. Right. That's just good. Obviously communication. Yeah. Do take advantage of the fact that he is locked. If the mood strikes, <laughs> Be wicked. Trust me. He may curse your name, but he's going to love every second of it. And it's going to reiterate to him that this is working, right? If you fool around and keep him locked, you're, you're into this. It's working. Yes. She loves it. Right, so <laughs> yeah, don't worry about that. Do accept that no one is more worthy of attention from him than you. Oh, right? I accept like that. that. Accept that and you'll love it. Yes. Um, don't shame for wanting to try it. This is not about a kink. This is about the relationship. You cannot want to do it. You can say this isn't working. You have every right to say this is not for me. Just don't be, don't use shame as the way to say it. Right. Um, don't do anything you don't want to do. Uh, sort of along those lines. Yeah. Um, don't don't forget the bonk. Be there. Right. For them. Yes. The person, yeah. And don't be afraid to lengthen his time in chastity. Right. <laughs> If, if he wants out and he needs out and he said two weeks is done, that's great. But if you turn around and said, this was such a success, I want to go a little longer. Chances are he's going to say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can just picture that in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Like, like you see this like super strong, like muscly guy, just like practically squeeing with joy. <laughs> <laughs> All of his dreams have come true. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> but I think, yeah, it's very important for her to realize that that bonk is going to happen and that she needs to be prepared for that because, I mean, I, I as a woman wouldn't anticipate that. I don't know about aftercare because, like, I don't really know a lot about the whole BDSM things. And so I don't I, – it, it's a new concept for me. I wouldn't know. And I think a lot of women wouldn't wouldn't anticipate that. So I, that's really, really good advice. Yeah, I, but it makes sense. Historically, your your view of male orgasm is kind of like, uh, you know, wham, bam, thank you, man, right? We're very direct. And in, in, in I'm being a little bit um, not facetious, but uh, um, a little bit oversimplifying, you know, men are compl complex too. But when it comes to orgasm, there's a lot of ways we can do it, but there's one simple tried and true one. And it is usually, usually very simple, right? It, yeah. it goes, it goes exactly as planned. So the idea that like, wait, what do you mean? I gave you a, a you know, a hand job just like any other. And suddenly you're an emotional puddle. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So yeah. it's not, nobody yeah. would expect that least of all men who have spent their entire lives doing this possibly one time a day, maybe more and have never had it like, level them emotionally that is very very unsettling so that's one thing but again once you know what it is it's not unsettling it's just biological and yes. then it becomes another way to be um together yes. right you yeah. know that's, that's the other side of it yeah okay i have three 
chastity stories for you. Okay, let's get into it. <laughs> all right, so uh, these are fails. Um, all right, so this first one uh, comes, these all come from Twitter, and I'm not going to share their names. I know some of them might be listening, but I, it's just best if I don't share their Twitter handles or anything. Some of them gave me permission to, but I'm going to pass on that. Um, so this first one, uh, I'm just going to read it out. He says, we were with another couple at a restaurant, and I was locked up in a CB3000, which is a nice, big, as I believe, metal um, uh, device. Sorry, that's me adding in there. Uh, my <laughs> wife started playing footsie under the table, and I got excited and hard. Oh, she's so cruel. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> she obviously enjoys being a key holder. So much so, the seam of my penis cage split. Okay, so this is... Oh, the CB is a resin one now that I remember. Yes. At first, it was a bit of relief with the extra space. <laughs> but then, like all good things, it ended abruptly when the split seam was no longer being forced open with my heart on. So it snapped back into its original shape, <laughs> snapping a good chunk of flaccid dick <laughs> and strapping it in the seam. Oh, my God. Oh, ow. I'm making that. Stefan face from Saturday Night Live with his hands. And I'm just like, ouch. Okay. I went crazy and without thinking, I blurted out, give me the key. <laughs> <laughs> Confused, shocked, and dismayed, she said, it's at home. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I got up and wobbled to the toilet to try and free myself. <laughs> I was able at least to free the skin and put it back inside and return to our table. Oh. Uh, luckily, our friends were not exactly vanilla, but nevertheless, it was really awkward to explain what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> the woman laughed while the other guy looked nervous and, <laughs> and remained uncomfortably silent. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh that's oh, I funny can imagine just oh it's, oof, oof. <laughs> just the thought of it being pinched in there okay next one now you have to bear with it this person's first language is not english okay okay my biggest fail is when i started to use some cages uh i bought some cages small enough so that i needed to use lubricant for inserting the penis and I just wanted an accurate fit. Now, that's pretty common, right? Because yeah, yeah. uh, I'll tell you mine at the end of this, and it involves not getting one small enough. Uh, I wanted an accurate fit before heading to the most, uh, hearing the most beautiful sound a man can hear, a click from a chastity lock. Oh, how nice is that? <laughs> Instead of using lubricant, however, I got soap. The result was awesome. I think what he meant by that is that it was a very good lubricant. Okay. But I okay. only wore it for six to eight hours. Two days later, my, oh, my skin peeled off. <gasps> exactly as if you got burnt from the sun. Uh, so he goes on to say like, oh, I went on the internet and I found out that like lubricant doesn't exactly translate the same. Um, he was a little bit worried, but after one week, the skin reappeared. Um I, I mentioned this to some friends who told me that soap is not a good thing to leave on your skin <laughs> unattended. And um, I tend to use less of it now <laughs> as a result. <laughs> I use lube now and everything works okay. But, oh, can you imagine the first time you get a chastity device and two, <laughs> two days later your skin falls off? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I have not heard of that happening, but I can definitely see that happening. Yes, it was it was like he sent me the picture of it and it looks like a, a kind of hand soap, which I imagine is slightly more caustic. Oh, than, yes. Yeah. than the soap you use to wash your hair. I, if he had used that, I think while it wouldn't have been nice, it probably wouldn't have been as bad. <sighs> OK. OK. This the last one here. My funniest chastity story at home, locked up. And suddenly I remembered my dentist's appointment has been moved up 20 minutes. I lived close enough to walk, so out the door I went. I got there with a minute to spare. As I sat down in the chair, I suddenly realized my chastity device, a mature metal queen's keep. Oh, somebody should post that in the group here so you can see what it That's looks like. That's my favorite cage. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it made an odd bulge in my workout shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, a speck of metal could be seen at times. In my rush, I had forgotten to change clothes into something that would cover it up better. At one point, the dentist assistant looked down at my bulge and stared quizzically for a couple seconds. Then she made me lean back, which made it even worse. <laughs> She said nothing, and fortunately, the rest of the appointment went smoothly. But I make sure to wear different clothing now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I had a boyfriend one time. He was locked up, and um, he hurt his back, and he had to go for a CT scan. He went with his cage on <laughs> into the oh. CT scan. I was like, "You can't do that." <laughs> <laughs> and he got this doctor got the report and called him and he was like uh yeah so you know you've got this thing <laughs> below your waist <laughs> oh I, I have er doc friends and they will tell me that they are they are used to this kind of stuff and finding a chastity cage bothers them a lot less than having to, to fish whatever weird thing you've stuck up your ass and can't get out. <laughs> so there's that. I mean, ER docs have seen everything. You shouldn't be nervous about that. Now, I've also heard you can go through airport body scanners and they're just like, whatever. Yeah, they don't care. Me, yeah. Which tells me one of two things. Uh, one of them is good and one of them is bad. Either they're like, this is so common that we know exactly what that is or – I don't give a shit about the metal thing this guy's got shoved down his pants, which is a little bit more <laughs> disconcerting if you're going to get on a plane. I think they just <laughs> really don't care as long as it's not uh, a weapon of some sort. Like, as long as it's not prohibited, they really don't give a shit what it is. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I will tell you this. This is my story, and it actually has to do with that. Um, I went on a business trip. and. It was a conference down in Miami, or as if you were from that area, Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife, I got to bring my wife with me. And we were going to be there for the conference for three days. And we decided to go ahead and make it five. So we packed quite an adventurous pack there, um, including my chastity cage, her, um, her Hitachi magic wand. They catered everything. And while we were down there, uh, at the catering, they had tiny bottles of Tabasco. Like you've seen these, they're like little tiny, they're like one inch tall bottles of task, Tabasco, single serving. So I stole like a thousand of these. <laughs> uh, um, and I put them in my luggage. And of course, like an idiot, I should have known that if you put a thousand tiny vials in your luggage, <laughs> you're going to get searched. And so they searched my luggage and they found uh, <laughs> my cage <laughs> her vibrator, a strap on and a thousand vials of Tabasco. And they were just like, Nope, Nope. I'm not dealing with this. Just like put the note in there. I mean, it was the most hastily shoved back in. You could imagine <laughs> with the note, the note that says this has been inspected, you know, shoved in there as well. <laughs> and just like it sort of half zipped. And, <laughs> and I got it back. I was like, Oh God. Okay. <laughs> Oh my god, that is hilarious. I wonder if they were thinking like the the, <laughs> the Tabasco is going to be used as a lubricant and it's just very cruel. <laughs> I know. It's like this poor guy, you know, she's got a strap on and a cage and, and a bunch of Tabasco. Just, this... <laughs> oh god. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, and then you, okay, so you are writing a book about chastity sex positions, right? Yes, that is correct. And you, I've noticed on Twitter, you've been trying them out. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't write about them if I couldn't try them out and kind of give them the thumbs up or the thumbs down. I think yeah. that's so awesome. Okay, and so do we know when that book's going to come out? So we're just finishing uh, a couple more of the positions and forgive me if I just want to try them a few times to make sure that they uh, <laughs> actually work. <laughs> um, and, and then I, I have some illustrators that thank you by the way, so much for helping me uh, broadcast that. I found some very great illustrators and oh, good. make a decision on that. And then we're going to illustrate them 
And once it's illustrated, we'll put the book out and it will depend entirely on whether or not Amazon sends me to naughty jail or not, whether or not we can really get that out there. But I will say that there are so many different types of chastity sex positions that, that they're all unique and they all kind of trigger different feelings and different experiences and it's it's really really fun <laughs> it's like if you're a couple that's doing this you're you're having a ball i love that i think that sounds like such an adventure like how like i think couples that you know wonder like how to spice things up and try different things together i'm like this would be the ultimate really chastity <laughs> sex positions <laughs> can't think of anything else that would be more fun <laughs> and well, interesting <laughs> Oh yeah, it is. And, and, you know, she's, she's having a ball with it, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I'm having a ball with it. Th th that's the thing. That's the hardest part to explain to somebody who's never done this. Like I, I can explain this to a lot of the people here who have, who have been in chastity and they understand at least the concept, right? Like they've probably been there when they've been locked and their partners fooling around with them. Hold on. Let me get my cat off my computer. That's that noise. <laughs> uh, if anybody owns cats, you know, there's no space that it all belongs to them anyway. But when you get involved with the sex positions, you cue in different parts of your brains because you're so used to having sex this way. And now you're having sex that way, but your penis doesn't get to participate. And so your brain has to come up with it has to make up the difference somehow. It has to figure out, you know what's going on biologically here. And if it can't make it work this way, it'll try and make it work another way. And just processing those feelings as they're happening while you're experiencing her pleasure and focusing on her pleasure, because that's the, that's the pleasure you're getting tonight. So you better <laughs> pay attention to it. It's just, it's, it's transcendent. I mean, everybody should do this once just to see, just to feel, just to understand what this experience is, right? You you learn so much more about your own body, let alone how much you learn about hers. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, okay. Let's wrap this up then. Um, Key, thank you so much for joining me. Where can everybody find uh, you other than on Amazon? So you can find me on Twitter. It is the one social media beyond the Moan app here that I am on. Um, and I do respond to DMs. So if you have questions, you can reach out to me there. Any of you who bought my books will find that at the end of them, I have my email address. Reach out. I do respond to that. I do love it when people uh, ask questions, further questions, or suggest uh, topics of research, or, or even tell me their own stories. I mean, this is, this is Sociology 101. It is experiential. It is how we learn. And I am always learning and hopefully y'all are too. So thank you so much for listening to me ramble on tonight. And thank you Venus, <laughs> again for just a fun fucking night. There, I'm gonna... <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad I was able to pop your moan cherry. So there you go. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> you did. All right, that's going to be it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely did. Make sure you go to venuscuckoldress.com. That's where you can subscribe to the podcast, register for Pillow Talk events, ask a question for the show, and learn about all sorts of cuckolding-related events and resources available to you. You can also tune in to Full Swap Radio every Tuesday the Venus Cuckoldress podcast is on there at 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. Central Time. You can download their app as well, so it's super easy to listen to. Now, make sure you go to venusconnections.com if you are single and interested in finding a loving cuckolding relationship. The Basic Men's membership is on sale now until September 1st. So make sure you go and check it out. There's a Frequently Asked Questions page where you can get all the information you need to decide if this is right for you. That's venusconnections.com. All right, that's going to be it for this episode. We'll see you next time.